Ray Chang and Robert Holter. If uh, one of you wants to share their screen, and I can blend it in into the stream. Okay. Uh, so you, Jerry. Yes, I see the screen, and the screen is up. It is all yours. Good luck. All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, attending and uh, joining this. And uh, you know, it's uh, tough times. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm Ray. I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. Um, and uh, I am uh, doing a lot of work around dependency management uh, here for our cloud libraries. And so we created a site called jlbp.dev. And we're going to talk through some of the things that I learned. And I learned everything from Robert Schulte. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is uh, Robert Schulte. Most people know me uh, from Apache Maven. I've done a couple of conferences uh, and do a lot of talks about it uh, just to explain uh, how strong Maven probably is, but also sometimes how hard it is. And especially this topic about dependency management, it is tricky sometimes. And uh, well, we only have 30 minutes, so uh, let's go. <laughs> yeah, and for the record, Robert is in Netherlands, I'm in the USA, and we're doing this session jointly, so this is pretty amazing. <laughs> so let's see the code. So I have some simple code here to demonstrate some of the things. And by the way, these are all the issues that I personally ran into when I was using uh, some of our client libraries that talks to Google Cloud Platform. And a lot has changed. A lot has been fixed. And uh, I had to go back in time to figure out, OK, what happened which, which, with the, what old versions and uh, to reproduce some of these issues. OK, so first of all, uh, this you know this is not the current state. It's definitely much better. Uh, but then, uh, but these are the issues that people run into constantly, and with or without you know some of our libraries, right? So this is a very simple test. Uh, I just created a test that simply uses a, a client library. In this case, it's just a dependency, uh, and I'm using two different dependencies here. I'm using the client library and also Truth to do some validation, right? So in my Maven Palm.xml, I have just two different dependencies here. I have Truth for validation and have the API client library. Uh, and Robert will probably code this out, which is out, well, if you're doing a test, first of all, put your dependency in the right scope so that it doesn't leak through the compiled scope, right? So let's set the scope to test. And uh, we should, there's only two dependencies, what could possibly go wrong, right? Right. <laughs> well, let's, let's give it a try. So I'm going to go ahead and run test from ID. Uh, there we go. So it's running the test, right? Everything should be working, but of course it doesn't work. Uh, and this is the type of error that we always see when we, uh, at the wrong time, when we have some kind of conflict with our dependencies. And uh, let me go back here. Um, I'm not sure like how many people on the stream actually see these arrows, no such method found, or no such method error, no such field error, or no class def found error. What happened, Robert? Why do these things happen and how do I fix this? So uh, probably what happened is that you are picking up a different class than expected. So there used to be some method. I'm not sure the check argument. Uh, uh -huh. And it doesn't exist anymore. And what's kind of amazing, it starts with com.google, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, the com.google.com, and that's usually Guava. So okay. at least we have some the detective work here that we know that it's probably in Guava somewhere. Um, so, so there's probably a dependency conflict with this particular artifact. How do we find out more? Well, most uh, most of the time, what you do uh, is uh, let's see a dependency tree. Okay, so I'm going to use Maven dependency tree to show me like what is the resolved dependency that Maven's actually going to be using, right? Yeah. So I'm going to say Maven dependency tree and. I don't know, man. Like everything here looks, I mean, it's obviously there's a lot, but right. uh, there's nothing here that tells me, hey, by the way, something could possibly have gone wrong. No, so this is the resolved uh, dependency tree. And uh -huh. you see also all the transitive dependencies. Even though you specified only two, you will get also all the dependencies of those dependencies. So, uh -huh. um, so how do we more detail? Out, right. So, what we can do is uh, we can add verbose to give you uh, more mm -hmm. information about uh, dependencies. So let me do dash D verbose. Uh, this way we can see a lot more information. Let's see here. Uh -huh. So for example, I'm going to find any one of these things with this interesting line, right? So mm -hmm. for example, put above Java, right? Uh, it says 3.9, but it was omitted because it was conflicting with another dependency that's in the tree. Yes. Huh. So 
so I guess we can figure out, okay, do we actually have some issue with Guava in this case? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say Maven dependency tree diverbose and let's do a grip, right? I usually just grip for the output here. Um, almost everybody uses grip. Almost everybody uses grip, but uh, but the result, the result of this is really weird because now it feels like Guava is depending on Guava, which is depending on Guava. That does not make any sense. What happened here? All right, so you're missing context and <laughs> Uh, what you see is that everybody first uh, prints this to a file and then do a, a grab over there. Uh, but there's a better uh, solution, and that's uh, by adding the parameter includes. And uh -huh. with that, like that, you can see uh, the the path to that uh, specific library you're looking for. So I can give it the uh, uh, the group ID and also okay. potentially the artifact ID, right? Yes, you can do that. Okay. So let's take a look at it this way. And this is a really, really good way for you to figure out if you actually have an issue with one of these artifacts. And wow, look at that. Um, all of these Guava uh, versions are being imported by another translative dependency somewhere else. And they're all over the place. Um, now, I guess one of the most commonly asked question is, why don't we just use both? Why can't we have both of them? Right, so how does the class path work? Um, I guess in the class path, if you have multiple classes, uh, it will pick the, you can only pick one, right? Exactly. So it will uh, pick uh, the first one it finds. Uh, and Maven has a, has a similar strategy and uh, it uh, works like uh, looking for the nearest dependency. So the deeper you go into the, uh, in the, in the tree of dependencies, uh, the, the less likely it is that's the one being picked up. So if you specify uh, your dependency directly in your POM file, that's the one being used, even though a transitive might have a different version. Uh huh. So for example, if I, uh, in this case, I guess uh, an older version might have been picked up because it was closer to my uh, my dependency uh, tree. And yes. so the newer version got omitted in this case. Um, and so um, it, we were potentially referring to a method that's only in the newer version, but not in the older version. Exactly. Uh -huh. But um, so one of the issue with the, this dependency problem is that uh, it's really, really hard to find, especially you only discover it when you're running the app, right? You usually get it when you're running the app and go through that line of code because the linking is dynamic. And um, it will be, what are some of the techniques that we should be able to catch some of these problems early, especially for this particular issue? Well, in this case, you're, um, you probably want to use the Enforce plugin. Most of the time, if there's something uh, you want to enforce during build, just have a look at the Enforcer plugin. And it has a, a huge set of uh, Enforcer rules. And you can also write them yourself, actually. But this one is interesting because the dependency convergence uh, is one that verifies that all the versions of the dependencies are exactly the same, which is kind of mm -hmm. tricky. Uh, but sometimes it, it's, it's possible. And the other one we have written is the upper bound. And that ensures that you're using the latest of the specified dependencies. But that ensure, uh, that requires that all those dependencies are backwards compatible, of course. Right. So let's uh, let's give it a try uh, very quickly. So here we have the dependency convergence plugin. And uh, if I were to add it to this particular POM file uh, during the build, in the build block build uh, and plugins and like that, Right, and now if I go back and do a Maven, I'm gonna do Maven clean install, is that right? Maven clean install, that's what everybody does. Come on, come on, why? Why clean, why install? What? We should is, do that how I make everything work, right? No, no, just to verify, <laughs> that's more than enough. Yes, Maven verify, okay, so don't do Maven clean install, uh, no, you know, no, please no, after no, the please. session to ask why, and also you can ask Andre Samire, uh, we do not want you to use Maven clean install. Uh, in most cases, Maven verify works, right? Okay, so let's do Maven Verify, and this will uh, run through the Enforcer plugin as well. And it tells me right off the bat that I have all of these libraries uh, that is uh, having uh, multiple versions in, in the build, and so we need to go ahead and resolve it. Uh, or we can do the upper bound here uh, with the upper bound rule, in which case it will only tells me the libraries that's using the older version as opposed to the newest version. Uh, right. But let's say we have these issues, how do we um, potentially resolve these? Right, so th there are, um, in general, there are two. One is uh, dependency management, where you say, uh -huh. okay, um, I I'm going to specify globally which version should be used. 
And the other one is exclusions, which is kind of dangerous because you, if you exclude some code, you are uh, responsible that it's included somewhere else, right? I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, by exclusion, we uh, we would explicitly exclude the offending um, artifacts. So in this case, for example, Guava is the one that's offending. We can go ahead and use the exclusion to exclude it explicitly, so that in the in our Maven tree we don't see this anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess I will look something like this. So I can exclude Guava from truth, and now I only have Guava twenty one in my in my tree. Uh, yes. Now dependency management, though, how does that look like? Uh, so dependency a management, it's it looks almost the same as you specify dependencies, but it just has an extra tag around it. And in the in the end, it's just a lookup table. So okay. in the, um, it's looking for uh, a dependency based on the group and artifact ID. And okay. if you have a specific version here, that's the one that's being used. I see. Yeah. So for example, if I want to override all of the transitive depend dependency version for Guava, uh, I can potentially use dependency management here. And so now when Maven is resolving come Google Guava with the Guava artifact, it will come here to see what version it, it should be using, right? Right. So um, if that's the case, let's go ahead and uh, go to this example directory, 3A, uh, oh, 3, 3B, sorry, 3B. <laughs> and uh, if we run through the dependency tree again and see Guava, uh, we should be able to see that uh, all of the Guava versions are now being managed up to, in this case, Guava 28.1, right? The original version may be this one, but now with dependency management, uh, all of them are now aligned to the same version. Right. Pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, we can use dependency management to overwrite your transitive or even direct dependency versions if you don't specify it. And that's, that's probably one of the best practice. Um, and um, you can say, hey, let's upgrade older version to 21 or let's upgrade older version to 28. Uh, and we'll just go ahead and uh, make that a reality. That's pretty neat. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely one of the one, first thing I learned from Robert uh, in solving all of these issues. Okay, now, Another though, thing, though, is that uh, sometimes we run into issues where maybe we're using two different versions of Guava that's not exactly compatible, right? A uh, really old version, like Guava 8, and a really new version, they're just not going to be compatible. And sometimes you may actually need to use both versions. Um, and this can be the case where the newest version doesn't work with the dependency you're using, but you need to use the new version anyway. Uh, what do we do in those cases? Because that's really, really difficult. Right, so uh, this is really the last thing you should think of. Uh, uh, but we have the Maven Shape plugin, and what it can do, it it can relocate uh, the classes, which means that it will change the package name in the end, uh, and also inside your code. And based on that, it is possible to have uh, multiple versions of Guava next to each other. I it's see. Re yep. It's really tricky because from that moment on, you cannot update it anymore. Uh, so that uh, you cannot update the Guava version through your dependency, uh, uh, transitive dependency anymore, because it's now embedded, encoded directly into your code as part, yes. it's part of your code now, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, sometimes there's really no way around this, especially if you're using Hadoop. I, I think a lot of people probably run into these things uh, when using Hadoop. They do have a really old version of Guava in the system class path. Uh, and if you use anything that uses the newer version, uh, there are going to be dependency conflicts because of the thing that Robert talked about, right? Because in the class path, only one these one of these Guava classes can exist, uh, and it will choose the system class path one uh, overwhelmingly. And now you're going to run into issue. In this case, you have to shade Guava that's in your application so it does not conflict with what's in your system class path. Okay, cool. So that, that was pretty cool. So at least we have enforcer plugins that can help us catch some of these things early, which is super, super cool. You do not want to wait until later. Now let's see the next example, uh, 3E. Um, let me see here, 3E, suspiciously named Clash. I wonder what that means. <laughs> so here again, we have a bunch of dependencies where I'm using two dependencies here, uh, Firebase, uh, you know, a real-time uh, serverless database that people can use, which is great and pop sub, which is messaging. So we got two dependencies here. I'm following the best practices here. I'm using dependency management to um, override some of the versions that was causing issues. And mm -hmm. I also have enforcer rule here too. So I'm using the enforcer rule. Okay, so let me go ahead and go to example 3D. Oh, which one is that one? Example 
3E clash. And we're just going to do a compile uh, because this will also kick off the enforcer and uh, everything is fine, which is great, right? So we follow the best practices using enforcer. And now we do Maven test to run one of these tests and let's see what happens. Okay, not again, what happened? Robert, I follow all the best, best practices. What happened here? We're seeing exactly the same message as before, right? So, uh, yeah, so no such, uh, no such <laughs> error. And again, com.google.com. So it's got <laughs> <the> Java again. <laughs> it's always that, right? Yeah. If you run into one of these issues, you got to find a package and, you know, it's, it's Guava in this case. Right. What happened? What? I follow everything we fixed previously. Why is it still happening? Well, my guess is that there are multiple versions of uh, this class on your class path. Uh huh. So even though we require upper bound, we should only have one single Guava artifact. Uh, somehow another class is being introduced. Um, so again, I guess we go to dependency tree and we see the verbose with a package for Guava. And let's see here. Hmm. That's, that's pretty good, but uh, let's drop down a level, right? So let's remove the specific artifacts and let's go to just the package, uh, the group ID um, and see what happened here. And by the way, this this particular thing was one of the hardest thing I ever had to troubleshoot because uh, it, it's really weird that this actually happens, but it does, right? And, um, and I think one of the things that, that we noticed was, wait a second, we have an artifact that's called Guava, right? In this one another one that's called guava-jdk5. Now, because it uses a different artifact name, there's no way for Maven to know that these two things are actually the same thing, they're just differing in version. And so now we are potentially introducing two artifacts, two jar files, but they both potentially have the same classes. And if we go back to the class loading in the class path, only one of these will be picked up. So both of them will be in the class path, but only one of them will work. And now we are potentially using the older version again. And this one was not picked up by the require upper bound um, the enforcer, enforcer rule. What do we do here? This one was really, really difficult. Yes, this one is uh, really uh, difficult because even though I said it within five seconds and I was right. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but this, this, is, this requires quite a lot of analysis, but... Um, also, we have now that we know that it was caused by a duplicate uh, class. There is a specific okay. rule for that as well. Oh yeah, yeah, there is. See, oh, there it is. Ban duplicate classes. So what does this do? Well, it goes through all your jar files, and it's just uh, um, registering uh, the, the classes being used. And at a, if it discovers some duplicates, it will uh, print them out and also mentioning which classes are duplicated and in which multiple jars they are located. Uh -huh. Interesting, that's good. So let's give it a try. So I'm actually going to add this plugin to you. I'm going to copy and paste as is, right? So I'm adding this band duplicate classes. You can configure a few other things. Um, so let's uh, try ahead. And, let's go ahead and try to compile again. And uh, hopefully this will, uh, at the compilation time, we see this issue right off the bat. Oh, look at that. All of these classes are being duplicated in potentially multiple artifacts uh, with different artifact ID. And by the way, we do have a, a Java library best practices rules now. It's called JLBP. So if you go to jlbp.dev, there's a rule that says, you know, no, 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 new, uh, no two artifacts should have the same classes. You should not duplicate classes in two different artifacts. And uh, this is uh, something that's new that we added. So we shouldn't see these issues anymore. Uh, but now we can see the result of this. Look at that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So looking at the dependency tree was really hard, but now in, with this enforcer rule, we can see the two offending artifacts right off the bat. And this is really, really good. Uh, yeah, I would highly recommend this for every one of your projects as well, in case you want to avoid some of these issues. Okay, cool. So let's go back to the examples. Um, let's, uh, let's look at example 3C. That's another really, really interesting one. Uh, 3C, it's suspiciously called misalignment. So I'm going to go ahead and um, again do my uh, test here. So I'm going to do Maven compile with some of the enforcer rule. So we added the require upper bound enforcer rule here. And we can see that the enforcer rule actually failed. And we can tell you that uh, in this case, there are two versions of this thing called gRPC stop, 1.0.1 and 1.10.1. And because we need upper bound, so we should be using 1.10.1. 
right? And so I go back to dependency management here. I'm using dependency management to override the version to the newest version. So now I'm using all the things that we learned in the past 15 minutes. Uh, and let's do a compile again. Right? And Robert, I'm again following all the best practices that uh, you have said so far. So everything compiled and let's cool. do another test. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, oh no. Oh, this not is another new. one. The, yes, it's not Guava anymore. Thank nope. goodness, right? But uh, but what is this now? This is a no class def found. So it's not no method found, but not this no class definition found. Um, this one is difficult too. This um, one is also difficult. And you need yeah. to know a little bit about uh, this project because this is a set of libraries that are always released uh, at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So what you would expect is that all their versions are exactly the same. Most people re recognize it's also from Spring, Spring Framework, Spring Boot, that these are a set of libraries. And in general, they should always have exactly the same version. Right, but because they're tightly coupled. Um, I think another example would be Netty, right? There are many different Netty modules, but they all have to be the same version. Otherwise, you get into issues. Um, SL4J, right? Some of these projects, they have multiple modules and you should always use the same version of the, the for all of the modules. So in this case, uh, it was again, very difficult, but we had to go into the dependency tree to read this line by line and say, okay, here's the gRPC Netty version. That's a 1.0.1, but then the stop version is 1.10.1 because it was introduced because we upgraded to the newest version but it obviously wasn't compatible with this other version. So we have to upgrade all of these other versions too, right? They have to be aligned. And this issue is what we call dependency misalignment. So in this graph, you can see that for gRPC, we have 1.0.1, but then for one of the modules is 1.10 and they are misaligned in version. So we haven't aligned it. Now, what do we do in this case, right? I can obviously go back to dependency management, but now I have to add these things myself as a user uh, over and over again. That's really annoying. Yes. And you don't know if you're complete, if you have right. all the dependencies. Um, right. Most, right now, most uh, uh, libraries uh, also provide a BOM file. A uh, BOM file? BOM file is a list of dependencies that are all part of uh, this set of uh, libraries that should have exactly the same version. Uh, and you can add that to your uh, own BOM file. It's, in the end, just one managed dependency. Uh, uh -huh. you add it to your project, and that ensures that all the versions are in line with each other. Okay. So in this case, let's take a look at the gRPC bomb. So what's in the bomb file? What you, what um, is, yes. So, so the bomb file is really just a set of dependency management uh, blocks where the bomb file, so rather than adding the dependency management in my own pomp, uh, I can have this dependency management in a bomb, and then I can then reuse these versions, right? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. So, the solution was the, to do a copy paste of this and put it inside your own pom, but that's kind of ugly, of course. So, that's why we have that this bomb file uh, concept. And okay. It's a little bit tricky so, how do I actually add it? Uh huh. Yeah. So, let's take a quick look on how to do that. So, mm -hmm. in this case, uh, what we can do is to uh, import the bomb uh, that somebody else already created, right? In this case, the gRPC libraries have a single bomb that can then overwrite all the versions and align them together. So like here is the bomb file. This is the POM with the dependency management inside. And then to consume it, we can use in our dependency management, rather than copy and paste all of those things, we come to this block. And uh, the important part here is the scope is import and the type is the POM and now everything that's in this file becomes part of yours as well. Is that a fair way to say that? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty Absolutely. much how it works. Yes. Nice. Very cool. So with alignment, then uh, this thing then should work and compile as well. So that's uh, that should be pretty awesome. Uh, and by importing this bomb, we can then overwrite all of these uh, gRPC libraries. Um, but you know, everyone should probably create a bomb. Like what are some of the practices here for creating the bomb? Right. It, it all depends on uh, if you are a library uh, creator or a framework creator. If you're working on applications, it doesn't really make sense, I think. But uh -huh. th those library and framework creators should also provide a bomb file. If it's not there, please ask them to also create one for you. 
because it's, mm -hmm. as you can see, it can give you a lot of headaches if you are not doing it right. Right. So, um, and for library creators, if, especially if you're doing a multi-module projects that's tightly coupled, in this case, gRPC, Netty, and many, many other things, uh, all of these things, if you're creating something similar, you should also create a bomb so that your user can import the bomb to uh, configure the library versions, right? Right. Now, what should also go into the bomb? Um, it should, um, like, for example, if I'm using, uh, if I create a library that has, that uses Guava as the transitive dependencies, should I be adding Guava into my bomb too? So my user can use the same no. version of Guava that I want to use? No, you should only uh, uh, add those parts that are part of the MAVE multi-module project. So those that are in sync with, have to be in sync with each other. I see. So like in gRPC, again, if I go back to this uh, this example for gRPC, they only include the sub modules for gRPC, and but not their translator dependencies, right? Right. Mm, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> we are about 15, what, 20 minutes in, uh, 20, 25 minutes in, and uh, we've done a lot already. Um, now, the final thing here is that one of the things I do want to mention is um, if all things fails, another thing that's really, really cool is linkage checker. So this thing is created by the team here at Google uh, to help solve some of these problems. And what this is surprisingly yet another enforcer rule, like what Robert said, you can enforce and check these things with an enforcer rule. So this enforcer rule will do static analysis on your code to make sure that all the calls, all the methods are reachable. Okay, in the current resolutions, so that uh, you can detect these things early during the compilation time, as opposed to runtime. You don't want to figure these things out during runtime because that's already too late. Uh, if all of these other best practices still doesn't find you the issue, uh, you should add this static analysis tool so you can find the issue early. So you can definitely check this out. Okay. So with that all being said, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I just want to add that uh, a lot of the things that you saw. If, especially if you are creating your own library, uh, all these rules and best practices are documented in jlbp.dev. So please, please go check it out. It's got all the best practices in here, uh, all 20 of them that you should follow, uh, especially if you are creating a new library. Uh, so please, please go there and check it out. Um, but uh, also very importantly for Robert and Maven, uh, I think you have something uh, to add that's even more important. Well, do you think, uh, I think Brian has something to say, right? Oh, well, I have something to say that, first of all, we have to go in Q&A. We've got three minutes left, but I know what you're going to say. That is that everybody is using, or a lot of people are using Maven. And unfortunately, we only have a handful of contributors. So if you are using Maven and you want to, and you depend on Maven, um, just like the dependencies you bring in, you want, it to, want them to be healthy, make sure that you also contribute to Maven because we need your help if, uh, if we want to solve all the issues. And just with, for instance, 10 people that work on that uh, uh, and millions of people are using Maven, that might misalign. But let me quickly go to a few questions because we have two minutes left and then the next speaker is already, already uh, up in my, uh, my backlog. First of all, <laughs> Always, the, we have always the question, why shouldn't I be using Maven clean install? And I've got the question over here as well. But the, oh, the good oh. one is, the good, the good question is, okay, is there some cheat sheet or something which Maven command I have to use when? And so this person, like, I want to learn. And I, I think a lot of people are like that. So uh, do you have, uh, Robert, do you have got any resources on that? <laughs> Uh, yes, we are, have, of, of, of course, our website, but it is an overload of information and it's probably quite hard to, to find, uh, especially this kind of questions. Um, I think uh, if you understand the whole lifecycle stuff and what clean does and what install does, then you probably should understand why you don't need the clean and why you don't need the install. Uh, so the short answer is clean will remove everything you've already done so it will remove the target directory and it will recompile remove uh, of re uh, uh, add all those resources you already touched probably um, so in general it's it's just consuming resource consuming you don't need that and the install only uh, what install does is copying uh, those jar files to your local repository why don't need it there yep. so in so general ba so basically files, so basically so basically what you say is make sure that you know every step within Maven and what every step does. Yes. 
All right. Um, always got this kind of question as well. Are there similar things in Gradle? But I think you are the wrong person to ask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to an announce it. I mean, Robert is the chairman of Maven and probably not using Gradle. So uh, I'm sorry to say that this 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 question is probably not going to be answered in this stream. Um, guys, I'm uh, I'm moving forward. I want to thank you for this uh, this talk. We are on a tight schedule, so um, it was a pleasure to have not one Java champion but two Java champions in my stream. Amazing to have you here, and uh, I will bring I will bring.